I've always had a childlike love for uh, Halloween. And as I've grown up, it hasn't really gone away. Every year I think, why am I decorating my yard? Um, you know, but every year it gets decorated. And, um, you know, it's one thing when you have small ch children in the house, but I just love Halloween. I do. Uh, so a few years back, I decided, you know, there's a lot of art history that you can cover and you can use artworks that fit really well with this theme. And so every year it gets added to. Uh, so um, there's a number of slides. There is a slide list as well. Um, now, some of the images are more within um, the parameters of my typical class timeline, uh, which is usually impressionism to contemporary. But um, I'm going to start a little bit farther back because we're going to give you a little bit of the medieval as well. And so uh, anyway, uh, it's one of my favorite uh, lectures to give. And so it's the first time I put it online uh, and, and recorded it. But again, we'll see how it turns out. So scary art. Oh, here's the disclaimer. Some of these images may make you uncomfortable. Um, uh, they may, um, you know, be an image that for whatever reason you don't like. Not all art is pretty. Uh, so uh, yes, there are some gruesome images, I, I assure you, in this um, lecture. Now for some of you are like, yay, uh, but for some of you it might not be your favorite. But again, we, we do a lot of pretty lectures too. Uh, so in any case, Halloween is a huge business. It's growing and growing and growing. Um, it's a $9 billion uh, business, second only to Christmas as far as being a money maker. And so uh, uh, typically, as I go about my life, I'm always looking for interesting pictures to put into my presentations. Um, and uh, clowns, if you were to ask your grandmother how she felt about clowns, most people would say, oh, I have great memories of clowns. That's pretty much gone away. And we can thank um, horror movies for that. Uh, so um, uh, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people enjoy clowns clowns, mimes, for myself included, ew. Um, but, but even so, um, you know, some, some of those images are incredible. So yes, clowns do show up later in this lecture as well. So um, there are some local um, ghost walking tours that are pretty cool. Um, and uh, we went on one uh, last year uh, that was in orange, and it, it's pretty cool. Uh, and I recommend it highly. Now, uh, with COVID and everything, is it still going? I have no idea. Uh, but uh, certainly, um, uh, it's a walking tour. It's for the most part outside. That's the only disappointment. I was hoping that we we're going to go inside. Um, but no. Uh, but it's certainly worth doing if you have an opportunity. The uh, ghost tours, walking tours of Orange. Um, and then I, I like to start this lecture with a ghost story. Uh, growing up, my mother was a great collector of antiques and she went through a Victorian phase. And we had this chair, which is uh, pictured there, and it's set in the corner of, of our, our living room in the front of the house, something I saw all the time. And sometimes when you come down the stairs, and just as you turn the landing, you'd see a man sitting there that looked kind of green and see-through, and he'd be reading. Uh, and uh, no, this is not an actual picture. Uh, this is an enhanced picture that my daughter did for me when I described to her exactly what I saw. So, and indeed, uh, it is my father uh, sitting in that uh, chair. Uh, so in any case, um, uh, it, it kind of came with a man. So uh, am I the only one to have seen it? Not even close. Um, it was, my mom saw it more than once, I saw it more than once, I want to say three or four times. And then my dad never saw it, I don't think, I think my brother was too young. And I had a cousin who saw it, um, so it was kind of well known. Uh, now it was, it's a very old chair, and you can see it's um, Victorian in nature, and it was filled with horse hair. And, and oddly enough, I was asking my mom questions about it last night, and she said that um, after a while, she decided that maybe, maybe the chair should go. Now, interestingly enough, it didn't go right away. It stayed there through her Victorian phase. 
But then um, at some point she decided she wasn't into Victorian anymore, so it was going to go. And with it went the man. So this was a man that was very attached to his chair. You all know somebody who has to sit in their chair at home. I think we all know one of those. Uh, so yes, it even had indentations of, of where the man probably in his alive state uh, would sit. Uh, but in any case, when she sold it, it, um, it went away, never saw him again, didn't hang out in the house, definitely went with the chair. And uh, in any case, um, she actually told me last night that she had sold it uh, and she sold it for a really high number a number of years ago. Um, and, I, you know, I think she said she got $400, which probably be the equivalent to something like 1200 or 1500 today because this was a number of years ago um, but uh, in any case um, she said she was really surprised that she was able to resell it for that amount so somebody got a little gift with purchase but whatever um, but the lesson of course is that money you can't take it with you and so you're to uh, redeem yourself redeem your soul um, before you pass away and so in any case, it um, uh, looks kind of stiff and awkward in some ways. And that's, again, you don't really get the development, full development of the figure until the Renaissance in painting. Uh, often there's not a really excellent sense of perspective. Um, there's an awkwardness to it. But even so, there's something very interesting about uh, Bosch. And he certainly had the imagination. So um, this was a time period where people were deeply uh, superstitious. Uh, they were afraid of things like bathing. They thought that um, uh, that could make you sick and open you up to all kinds of infection. Um, they had a uh, fear of plague. Disease was very, very prevalent. It wasn't uncommon uh, to die in the, your 30s or 40s. Um, it, was, it was really, really a difficult time. And then... Um, in the bottom corner, you see a letter, uh, this uh, kind of creepy, monstrous thing holding a letter. Um, again, it's up to speculation what it's for. There's some thought it might be an indulgence um, during this period. Uh, some people would uh, purchase indulgences through the church as a way to um, uh, get pardoned for their soul and for any of the wrongdoings in their life. And then uh, in the second uh, panel, you can see some of the details. Titian, Tiziano Vesselio, but we know him as Titian. And uh, Titian is a Renaissance artist, and he's an important Renaissance artist. And this is the punishment of Marcius. Now, if you were to look upon this, you would really need to have the background. And um, this is about having too much hubris, having too much, um, uh, well, I don't know, uh, arrogance. Uh, hubris was basically, um, uh, again, this, this sense of just being too full of yourself. And so um, uh, Marcius claimed to play his uh, instrument better than Apollo, better than the god Apollo. You don't want to be pissing off the gods. And so um, it was a good idea um, to not uh, tick off the gods because bad things were going to happen if you did. And so here you have this cast of many beasts and humans, and they're participating in this incredible, horrible uh, flaying of, of flesh from a man because Marcius was skinned to death alive. So meanwhile, the only redeeming feature is um, this little angel that is in the back corner to somehow comfort him as he is uh, going through this horrendous, horrendous um, event. One of the darker Titians, by the way. Peter Paul Rubens. Um, so uh, now we're moving into the Baroque. Uh, Peter Paul Rubens, uh, Saturn devouring his son, and then uh, Goya also tackled the subject of Saturn devouring his son. Um, it's part of his black paintings a couple centuries later. So two depictions. I uh, personally think Goya is perhaps, is perhaps a 
little bit more gruesome, but they're both pretty horrendous, quite honestly. And so, so it would probably be interesting to um, have the backstory. It would certainly be helpful to your understanding. Uh, so uh, Saturn is the Roman god, um, and the equivalent would be um, Kronos in Greek mythology. And Kronos was the father of Zeus. But Kronos, again, we're, we're calling him Saturn here because that's the Roman uh, equivalent. Uh, Saturn uh, was told in a prophecy that he uh, was going to be overthrown by his children. Well, he didn't know which child, so the perfect solution seemed to be to eat them all. And so it's this horrific, horrific story. And, um, and it's an interesting choice for Goya, who um, uh, deaf, unhealthy, his late work is definitely sinister. And we call them the black paintings. And this is again, I think, one of the darkest images in art history. So again, here, here it is uh, summarized on another site. So Saturn, ruler of heaven and earth, a titan that ruled with his wife Rhea, associated with Kronos, Kronos, so you can see the different spellings, the god of time, shown here with the scythe, he harvests time. The three stars allude to Saturn, the planet, hence in Roman mythology is called Saturn. Um, in the Metamorphosis, Saturn killed all his sons in order to keep them from overthrowing him. He was later overthrown by Zeus, his only surviving son. And then Zeus actually, um, through some trickery, gets uh, his father to uh, vomit up his, um, his brothers and sisters. Again, with mythology, you have to kind of supersede belief and just go with it. Uh, if you haven't read Greek and mythology, uh, Greek and Roman mythology, you should because it's pretty intriguing. But um, don't always try to make sense of it. It's almost impossible. So Goya often depicted witches and, and these dark paintings, these what were called the black paintings near the end of his life. Uh, some were painted on the walls of his home and then later removed um, and are now in museums. Uh, he was physically and mentally in ill health and deeply unhappy about Spain's politics at the time. Uh, he lived in the last few years of his life in Bordeaux, France. And so this is a detail of witches' Sabbath, uh, where you have these witches and these witches' familiars in a sense, a sense uh, that there's dark uh, magic happening here. So this nocturnal gathering of witches, again, part of um, the lore surrounding uh, Christian European um, tradition and legends. The concept that dates from the mid 14th century when it was first appeared in Inquisition records. Um, and then um, the idea of the Sabbath or the Sabbat de uh, derived primarily from the seventh day of rest, which is a day that you were to make holy by resting and not doing work. Um, the goat here is believed to be by some the devil, or it may indeed just be the personification of evil. Either way, it's kind of sort of the same. Um, but definitely Goya was certainly uh, seeing some of the ugliest parts of human nature in his time. And you can kind of look at the faces and have a sense of what he thought about uh, what was going on in his world at the time. Goya's uh, witches and wicked women. Uh, and so, again, um, terrifying visions, uh, cruel, superstitious, uh, a world without hope, all of these things. And again, in the latter part of Goya's life, he was deeply unhappy. And they show that in his later works. Some of his witches laugh, others grimace, visions are uh, the titles written by Goya beneath his sketches. Um, so sometimes he, we even have a little bit of the background of what he's trying to show. One face glares out darkly at, at us while his partner, nestled close, grins emptily. Uh, neither uh, personification is quite human. And so again, you see this kind of a sense of this 
um, witch uh, casting her spells on the on, in the first image, and in the second image, uh, this is an, another artist, and uh, his uh, witch is decidedly more seductive uh, than Goya's. So they've been depicted for centuries. Um, so uh, mid 1400s illustration, uh, Martin Lefranc's depiction, um, and these are on uh, illuminated manuscripts. So you can see a, a page from this illuminated manuscript here. Okay, we're going forward in the centuries pretty fast. Uh, Henry Fuseli, The Nightmare, 1781. This is a masterpiece that is at the Tate, and it exemplifies romanticism. It's voyeuristic, it's emotional, uh, it's from uh, folklore, um, and uh, this his idea was to create a work that was particularly appealing and um, almost um, almost looking like a legend of sorts. It doesn't have that background. He wanted um, basically it uh, to allude to these sort of superstitions or or a nightmare uh, that you might have. And so he pur purposely left it pretty open to the imagination. So uh, is it sexually charged? Well, absolutely. Look at the way she's kind of flayed across the bed. But it's also very mannerist in um, approach because look at the elongation of that figure. I mean, she looks like she's possibly nine feet tall. She's uh, very, very elongated. Uh, so mannerism is where an artist takes certain aspects and basically, you know, stretches them or pulls them or makes them her neck look longer or whatever it is. And it's a device that art, artists often use. So uh, it, it was very popular when it was viewed in 1782. It's still very popular. This is a really, really engaging work. We look at it and we want to understand it fully. Uh, and you can never really be sure. He wanted it to intrigue people. He wanted it to be mysterious. You have this horse as a prey animal with its glowing eyes. And then you have this gremlin of sorts um, sitting on her, uh, this kind of goblin figure, um, certainly sinister. So is this an allegorical nightmare or is it an, a nightmare that's really happening? We don't know. But again, that's part of the appeal. Um, also in Romanticism, the great William Blake, known for his poetry as well as for his um, draftsmanship. And so this is the great red dragon and the woman clothed in the sun. He did a few of these works and they are um, uh, based roughly on um, uh, revelations in the Bible. And so it's uh, very much um, whimsical imagination. Um, there's all sorts of details in here, uh, but again, it's very, very open-ended as far as that goes. Uh, but it, it, the ideas of it do stem from um, the last book of the Bible, Revelations. Uh, Ghost of a Flea, 1800s. Uh, this, again, this kind of monstrous uh, creature was very much part of his vision, if you will. So English printmaker, poet, painter, uh, and uh, again, his art uh, today is probably more famous than his poetry, but certainly... Um, he was uh, famous for both in his time. His works have a what he calls a personal mythology um, that can um, be incomprehensible at times, but still they're fascinating. And so these were watercolor, and he painted these in the early 1800s. And this is again uh, the great uh, red, red dragon. And again, if you look closely in the foreground, there's this woman that looks victimized. So it's this cosmic battle between good and evil that unfolds in this dramatic watercolor by a romantic poet and visionary, William Blake, uh, warning Christians to guard their faith in the last days. Hokusai is most famous for, of course, Great Wave of Kanagawa. We simply know it for the most part as Great Wave. And this uh, represents in the background 
Mount Fuji. He did a series of works um, called um, a, a 36 Views of Mount Fuji. And this is uh, one of the most famous of the prints, however. Uh, it's been reproduced in images and prints and reproductions and t-shirts, you name it. Um, and so Mount Fuji is considered um, basically sacred, special to the Japanese. And so uh, it shows up in a lot of their important works. And here you have an asymmetrical work. Uh, it has a lot of um, use of blue, which was very popular at this point in time. And you also have um, these boats that are basically in the midst of these incredible waves. And they're trying to stay um, uh, basically afloat in this great wave. And so it's just this really intriguing work of man against nature, but it's asymmetrical. And indeed uh, it um, was a print. So it was widely circulated. People knew of this print as they do. Again, why do we do this to uh, famous art? But we do, and we'll probably continue to do so, um, but over and over and over again, uh, images like this almost become iconic in pop culture uh, because you see them on things and you look at them, and you go, that looks familiar. And again, you find out what it is. So it's by Hokusai. Jericho, Theodore Jericho, severed heads. Um, now, he would actually do anatomical studies and he would get um, parts of human bodies uh, from the morgue. And um, and this is not uncommon. Other artists did it as well. well Leonardo da Vinci is said to have done it as well. Uh, but uh, Jericho's, these are his uh, severed heads. So keep in mind that he's painting these very, very realistically, but he would have been looking at the real heads. So pretty gory. Jericho anatomical pieces. Again, this is realism. This is pretty much as real as it gets. And this is 1819. And so uh, again, anatomical pieces, these would have literally been um, things that he got at the morgue. Well, why was he getting them at the morgue? Well, he wanted to get really, really gifted at drawing the human form. And one of the ways in which to understand the human form and know the human form is by doing such um, sketches. And so, um, you know, today in art school, you probably could use uh, some sort of mannequin, but he was working from almost life. Uh, and so he's, again, he's working from these uh, anatomical pieces. And so this is realism. Eight. Okay, so I stopped and I pulled my Dante's Inferno off the shelf for you. Um, and I'll kind of go over uh, this canto. So this canto or circle of hell as it is. So just as Capaccio finishes speaking, two ravenous spirits uh, come racing through the pit and one of them sinking his uh, tusk into Capaccio's, Capaccio's neck drags him away like prey. His companion, Griffolino, identifies the two as Giovanni uh, Cicci and Mira who run ravening through the pit through all eternity, snatching at other souls and rend rending them, tearing them. So these are the evil impersonators, falsifiers of persons. In life, they seized upon the appearance of others and in death, they must run with never a pause, seizing upon the infernal apparition of these souls while they in turn are preyed upon by their own furies. So essentially, they're in this state forever. So it's pretty dark. Um, that's an understatement. So let me move my light here a little. Okay. Um, so um, like Bouguereau at this point was hungry. He wanted to uh, succeed in the academic salon. So uh, uh, Dante's Inferno was popular. And uh, certainly uh, he wanted to uh, do something uh, that would show his talent. And certainly you see his talent for uh, the, the anatomy of these two male figures. Uh, you know, you have twisting, writhing figures. They're done very realistically in this very warm palette. And um, this was uh, a work that was much 
uh, loved by the uh, romantics, Dante's Inferno. Also, uh, uh, Rodin, you'll remember, loved um, uh, the Inferno as well. And so Dante, accompanied by Virgil, watches this fight between these damned souls. And in, in the background, you see this devil leering uh, in the background, and then you see this um, uh, twisted uh, face in the corner of uh, the individual that's kind of uh, grimacing, looking at these two that are uh, writing in front of him. So it's pretty wild, pretty realistic too. So here it is, you can see a detail of this work and you can see just entirely how accurate the uh, details are. It's really quite remarkable. And then again, this one you can see better, the figure underneath leering up at them. Some of you probably have never seen this work. And this is by um, Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh uh, did Head of a Skeleton Smoking, which is really quite uh, before uh, its time because uh, people like to say that, oh, they didn't know that smoking was bad for them. I'm pretty sure they did know that smoking was bad for them. Um, but even so, um, it is before his time. And so 1880s, he has the skeleton smoking. Uh, and these skulls, when you see these skulls in art, these are vanitas. They are symbols of death. Uh, and these vanitas paintings show up in painting. Um, they are memento mori, uh, reminders of death, was what a memento mori means. And you see these reminders of death in all kinds of things, a melted candle on a, um, in a painting, a skull in a painting, an hourglass that's running out of time, all sorts of images. So um, certainly uh, uh, smoking uh, since, again, the 1960s is when they really actively started to tell people that smoking was bad for them. And so here you actually can see an old vintage uh, advertisement of uh, the late president Ronald Reagan uh, when he was a young actor. And he says, I'm sending Chesterfields to all my friends. That's the merriest Christmas any smoker can have. <laughs> so yes, yeah, very different. And hell to your heart's content. So um, again, you won't see a lot of these anymore, these sort of advertisements. They're simply not allowed to. So uh, Surgeon General's warning. And uh, since we're talking about skeletons, um, Tim Walker's skeletal works. Tim Walker is a pho photographer. He's known for his fashion photography for um, uh, uh, magazines like Vogue. And he's pretty contemporary. Um, and so uh, internationally uh, well known, uh, born in 1970s. And his uh, interest in photography began uh, uh, in London and uh, he received uh, uh, degrees in photography at Exeter College, was awarded a third uh, prize as Independent Young Photographer of the Year. So he, he's been awarded things. He's done really well. And so um, you still uh, can see some of his um, works in fashion, in the fashion magazine. It's also been in W Magazine, Love Magazine, other places. Uh, but these are these huge skeletons that he does as these insta installations, essentially. And it was called the Storyteller Exhibition at Somerset House. This is Malgozia Bell uh, Bella skeleton from Harper's Bazaar, 2009. And again, the vivid colors of uh, this um, tall, red-haired uh, woman and then she appears to almost be dancing with a skeleton. Uh, here's another example. And you see this field of flowers, the skeleton. The fashion almost is, is secondary here. Poisoned apple. So uh, these are some interesting uh, images as well. They, again, look like some sort of uh, fairy tale or something. Uh, the second image reminds me a little bit of something you'd see like in a um, Tim Burton movie or something. Tim uh, Walker's Lita and the Swan. 
Leda also looks back to mythology. Uh, Leda was the wife of the king of Sparta and the uh, god Zeus um, seduced her in the guise of a, of a swan. So uh, he would kind of be a shift changer of sorts when he would see these women that he would want. Um, Walker's Mechanical Doll series, this is from Vogue. Um, a lot of people uh, think see old um, dolls and they think they're pretty creepy. And this kind of enhances that idea. So Tim Walker from Vogue, uh, Mechanical Doll series. Again, the pretty, pretty wild. Very, very whimsical, but certainly creative as well. Uh, Dreaming of Another World. Uh, this is also Vogue, but this is the Italian Vogue. And it almost looks like, again, different um, time-lapse photography, but it has this kind of ghost-like imagery as well. Private World. This kind of dancing, sort of a, almost sense of movement to it. And uh, this reminds me a little bit of Haunted Mansion. Uh, that time when you're in those little cars going across and you look down and you see them dancing. Pretty creepy. Uh, Tim Walker, Captura de Pantala, uh, Pantaya, uh, which I think basically means screenshot. And so here you have these skulls and these bones and, and this weird situation that you're not sure what's going on. And I certainly can't explain it. And again, I think that's part of the interest of this. Uh, dolls add a definite bit of horror uh, to many of these freaky images. And this particular doll um, is pretty wild too. Um, now, as an interesting aside, I have a doll that looks almost identical to that. Uh, if she was one that I inherited. She's about, I don't know, four feet high. She's huge. So Warhol tended to um, uh, present images of uh, cans of soup, pictures of movie stars. Um, um, you know, there are Liza Minnelli, Marilyn Monroe, uh, uh, certainly others. Uh, but this this seems to be pretty darker. Um, this is uh, uh, Warhol recognizing his own um, mortality. So he, he's posed here um, with a skull. And then the electric uh, chair series uh, was something that he did in different colors. And these electric um, chairs are pretty haunting and creepy. Creepy, But he didn't um, do those sort of, of uh, subjects regularly. These were pretty much a departure for him. He did do a disaster series, which was like on car crashes. But for the most part, uh, his work tends to be on the everyday object. So it's interesting how in different colors, it has a different sense. So when you're looking at one compared to another, one that has a slash of yellow might have an entirely different feel to it. But once you realize this is an electric chair, it's particularly haunting. You could also compare this to Robert Maplethorpe's famous uh, 1988 self-portrait. At this point, he knew he had AIDS, uh, Maplethorpe knew he had AIDS and he's literally confronting his death in this very famous image. Uh, his head almost looks like it's floating in a black background, but if you were to see the print, he's actually wearing a dark shirt with a dark background and you can kind of finely differentiate it. But in some of the uh, photographs of it, it almost looks like this kind of floating head. Alfred Kubin. A water ghost. He's an Austrian expressionist, a symbolist artist. His mother died when he was very young and he had a very difficult life uh, with his father. Uh, he tried to commit suicide on his mother's grave and literally took his angst and despair and put it into works such as these. He's one of the degenerate artists. Um, the degenerate artists were artists that uh, were considered degenerate by Adolf Hitler. And the Degenerate Art Exhibition was actually a number of famous artists and other artists. A lot of their works were actually ridiculed and laughed at 
Um, more than 300,000 people attended this degenerate art exhibition. Um, and sadly, many of the works were destroyed and or sold. Um, but um, again, it was related to um, the Hitler regime and um, degenerate was, again, they, they were laughing at these pictures. They were considered degenerates. These were, um, uh, Hitler did not like modern or contemporary art in his time period. Egon Schiele, mother and two children, and Madonna and child. Um, children tend to look kind of haunted and creepy in Egon Schiele's work. Um, and this, it, it seems to occur over and over again, uh, but it does have, a, fits perfectly in with the scary art lecture, certainly. So um, he was mentored and encouraged by Gustav Klimt, uh, the Art Nouveau artist. Sheila was an avant-garde expressionist artist, and you can see this in his all the swirling brushwork. It's very emotional. Uh, it certainly um, has a lot of depth to it. And Sheila, his works always have a lot and lot of movement to them. He was the youngest student to enroll at Vienna's Academy of Fine Arts. At only 28, he died of the Spanish flu with his wife as well. Uh, she um, died shortly afterwards. So his feelings about motherhood were considered complex. I think you could probably see that, can't you? He had a poor relationship with his own mother. She whined about his failure to fulfill his filial obligations to her. Um, and so from his point of view, his mother, and for that matter, any mother was of little use. And so uh, you do see a little bit of that distance. Uh, in some of his works. Louis Bourgeois. Louis Bourgeois is a very important uh, uh, sculptor, and uh, she is perhaps most known uh, for her sculptures of spiders. Well, if we're going to have a Halloween lecture, you've got to have spiders. And then um, uh, in the one with the beige um, uh, taupe uh, background, that's Odilon Redon. He's a symbolist, and it's called Spider. Uh, now, Louis uh, Bourgeois actually um, came from a family of weavers, and so she considered the idea of the spider, for the most part, a positive thing, and uh, didn't really look upon it like most people look upon spiders. And uh, so, again, she associated it with weaving and, and um and, and certainly one of her works is even called Mamam, uh, which is mother. And uh, she had a, a good relationship with her mother. With her father, not so much. His, her father carried on um, with um, uh, the nanny uh, as she was growing up. And, and she had some pretty horrific childhood memories. And that's Louise Bichois. That's my dog. All right. Uh, this work is by Giovanni. Baldini, look real close and you can see the skull imagery just beyond her shoulder. You have to kind of look. Uh, Baldini um, is a really interesting work uh, artist. His works have a ton of movement to them. Um, and he was dismissed because they thought that his work was too fashionable. He was too interested in ladies fashion. So they were dismissive of him. But he's very talented and uh, one of those artists that definitely should have had more recognition. So here's a quote from Louise Bourgeois, um, or about Louise Bourgeois. Uh, the artist saw spiders as fierce, fragile, capable of being protectors as well as predators. For Bourgeois, uh, it was an intricate and sometimes contradictory mix of psychological and biographical illusions. Again, her family were weavers. Uh, partly a reference to her mother, partly to herself, spiders for her represented cleverness, industriousness, and protectiveness. And this quote is from the MoMA Museum in San Francisco. Emil Nolda, 1910s mask. He also is a German expressionist and um, certainly um, named as one of the German expressionists, perhaps the thing that's most creepy. Uh, is that he was the only um, German expressionist that actually supported the Nazis, despite the fact that they destroyed 
over a thousand of his works and 27 of his works were displayed at the Degenerate Art Exhibition. So um, I always feel somewhat conflicted with Emil Nolda. You won't see a lot of his works in my class. Um, but uh, uh, again, expressionism, these dark masks, um, pretty creepy. And Zor was another painter who loved the macabre. Uh, this painting uh, supposedly depicts his critics, the skeletons that are indeed tearing him apart. And so uh, they actually have this uh, fish stretched uh, between them. Um, as far as the odd uh, furry hat that almost has this kind of Russian look to it, uh, what it means, they don't entirely know. It's one of the mysteries of this particular Ensor work. This is James Ensor. Matthew Rolson's, this is more contemporary, freaky contemporary exhibits sometimes cross into the very disturbing. This is the Talking Heads exhibition, 2010, and it was inspired by a ventriloquist dummies museum. Uh, and so um, uh, this particular artist went to this ventriloquist uh, museum and was so inspired that he took big parts of it and created these very, very large portraits of these really, really creepy faces. So I don't know, don't know what the whole green eyebrow thing is about, but it's pretty creepy. And so uh, these are some more example of Rolson's uh, creepy pictures. And so here you can kind of see the scale. So they're really large works. This is Matthew Rolson. Yeah, yeah, really weird. McDonald's uh, shelves uh, Ronald McDonald amid killer clown uh, craze. This is from uh, the Irish Times in 2016. Uh, if you've ever wondered what happened to Ronald McDonald, they started to basically tone down that image because of horror movies, largely. And so it was an image they decided that they should um, removed from their um, uh, marketing and their brand, basically, despite the fact you still have Ronald McDonald House and stuff like that. But this doesn't help. This was actually created by an uh, online presence called twosickbastards.com, and this was an image that was circulating for a while on the internet. Uh, and so this is called Evil Ronald, and he looks pretty evil. Andre Cortez. Uh, puppets and marionettes. Looks pretty creepy, doesn't it? Uh, so Hungarian, and uh, I don't often quote anything in Pinterest or blogs, but um, but I liked this. I feel like a pervert looking at them. <laughs> uh, there's something about the, these dolls. Th these are from uh, the beautiful doll marionette show, Paris, 1929-30. So, uh, and again, it feels kind of sinister. The same um, a photographer produced these. I would say, I would call them surrealist works, but he's doing this in the 1920s. And so um, it's very much uh, new and innovative. Uh, he said that um, uh, he was interested in the superficial. Uh, one wishes of this work. All I can say is that making them was very exciting very amusing. And so he, in the mid uh, 1920s, he uh, leaves his Hungarian homeland, he goes to Paris, and he basically um, starts associating uh, with the avant-garde. And so uh, uh, these, these works are really intriguing for 1920s especially. Again, they're very mannerist. Remember, mannerism is a feature in art history where Things are elongated or stretched or changed in some way. And you could definitely um, say it looks very much mannerist as well. Salvador Dali, this is surrealism, uh, 1930s when it was kind of at its height. And this is uh, Dali's uh, soft construction with boiled beans, a premonition of war. 
And again, you have that elongating, that stretching. And mind you, surrealism was about dream imagery, in this case, nightmare imagery. And um, it was uh, very much interested in uh, Sigmund Freud, um, writings of Sigmund Freud around uh, 1900. Um, and again, uh, psychology uh, and stream of consciousness, this idea of automatic writing. Um, so basically that state of wakefulness um, and you're, you're just starting to come out of a dream. Um, that was again, an ideal time uh, to think about your dreams and analyze your dreams and paint your dreams. Uh, so again, that time before going to sleep and that time waking up. Uh, so um, horrific image, grimacing face is pulled apart, pulls itself apart. And this is from Arneson. So haunting, creepy, and again, disturbing like a lot of Salvador Dali's work. This is Face of War, 1940. And so 1940, Dali goes to the US where he continued to paint. Trick or treat, Diane Arbus, uh, Arbus's creepy trick or treaters, 1950s. I would still be creeped out if these came to my doorstep. I mean, they're just really, really disturbing costumes. And Diane Arbus um, was a photographer, 1950s, um, that painted people that were on the fringes of society. Um, if she could find the unusual, um, the people that were, again, outsiders, those were the people that she was um, uh, photographing. Got to have clowns. Clowns are creepy. Uh, so these are Cindy Sherman's uh, Wacky Clowns. Now, Cindy Sherman, uh, what her thing is, is that she, generally speaking, dresses up in these costumes. And you're looking at Cindy Sherman. She does these self-portraits, basically. But she also is dressing up. Um, she grew up in a situation where she was often in the basement watching TV uh, and uh, kind of had her own little imaginary world, an isolated world to a certain extent uh, from her interviews. And um, she liked dress up and she liked, um, she got into this. And so um, uh, when you're looking at most uh, Cindy Sherman's, you can usually find the photographer in there. Now she disguises herself amazingly. And, and I'll put some clips in there that are fascinating. Cindy Sherman's a pretty interesting artist. She doesn't only do clowns. I should say that too. So international artist, uh, uh, in, her interests are an identity and the mask that people wear. She's sometimes controversial. That's an understatement. Um, some of her work um, borders on imagery that might be uh, pornographic to some. Uh, she dresses in very, very unique ways, takes a lot of photographs. She also uh, uses digital tools now to manipulate uh, photographs, backgrounds, and so uh, uh, this is Cindy Sherman. Okay, uh, Imogen Cunningham, uh, 1950s clown, Barnes uh, Circus. Imogen Cunningham uh, led a nice long life and uh, she was an important photographer. She's, I think she's just now fully getting recognized. Um, she, uh, she's a name that a lot of people do not know. And uh, she was raising her children, she was taking pictures, and she really has a unique uh, way of, uh, of uh, organizing her, her images. Her subject matter is sometimes different. And again, this is the 1950s and she's a female photographer. So her viewpoint was different as well. Uh, Paul uh, Caponegro, still life. This is hobby horse and doll. I don't know what it, what it is about some dolls, but a lot of them are pretty creepy. And so here's yet another example of one of those. So Rosamond Solomon, creepy doll series, 1970s. Imogen Cunningham, a doll with head between legs, 1970, and three heads, four arms. 
So these are Imogen Cunningham. So uh, she's also experimenting with these dolls. Uh, she started with a $15 camera that she actually sent away for. And this is a Weston uh, cat. Uh, Weston was also a photographer. That's what she's referring to. And I had to have a black cat, have a Halloween uh, lecture without a black cat. It was kind of a necessity. So Judy Tater, um, this is one of the more famous images of Imogen uh, Cunningham as a much older lady. And this is 1974. And it's Twinka Tebow. Um, and this is the daughter of, um, daughter of Wayne Tebow. And, and here we have this beautiful uh, model, Twinka Tebow, Tebow, excuse me. And it was um, inspired by a Thomas Hart Benton, a work called Persephone. And so um, I, I just thought it would be a really cool just to see a picture of Imogen Cunningham here. But I loved the, uh, this image because uh, you have this unique uh, contrast of textures, the smooth skin of this young woman, the trunk that is really, really rough and textured, and then the contrast of the older woman with the camera hanging around her uh, and the expression on her face, almost as if she's just come, uh, come around the corner. And indeed, um, I think it was posed, uh, but uh, Judy Dater, this is by far one of her most famous works. and. Uh, um, I, somewhere I think I have a, a clip on her and she talks about that. I don't know why some artists become famous for one work, but it certainly happens. Edvard Munch, The Scream, is one such example. Francis Bacon, Screaming Pope. Yes, he also was quite famous for his Screaming Popes and he produced them in 1950s. Later, he, he actually said, I regret ever doing the things. And I don't know that that's entirely true. It made him a, a fair amount of money. <laughs> it certainly uh, uh, gained a, quite the reputation from it, but I think he just got tired of it. Um, so this is Francis Bacon's Screaming Pope. And yeah, the, he was actually um, interested in Velazquez's um, a magnificent portrait of Innocent the X who was hardly innocent. Um, and uh, he um, worked on these uh, Pope paint paintings for 20 years of his life. So he was exploring it when in the south of, of France in 1946. Uh, the first surviving uh, version is Head um, 6, uh, which dates from 1949 and stopped in the mid 1960s. And by what they mean by surviving version is Francis Bacon, uh, uh, destroyed a lot of his own works. Uh, so in any case, um, he's an intriguing artist and uh, certainly um, questioning the, the value of the church. He's uh, certainly uh, expressionistic in this as well. Uh, so uh, here, here you can see um, what inspired the work and his vision of the work. And so um, gives you an idea of his works. This is uh, also one of his uh, works. And here you have this kind of monstrous figure and this giant slab of meat uh, behind him. And again, they're just creepy. Figure with meat. Uh, the art uh, critic, uh, Roberta Smith, said that if paintings had voices, Bacon's would, sh would shriek. Now, uh, Rembrandt and Soutine both um, had uh, these uh, carcass paintings. There's actually a long uh, tradition of still lifes uh, in, in art. So what might you think this is symbolic of? Look at it, look at it closely. And uh, you could have a few readings of it. You can talk about how um, it's there, it certainly has a sense of the crucifixion, and it also has a sense that um, life is short. You could say uh, that's part of it as well. Uh, and uh, again, it's they're pretty dark. 
This is actually from a 1989 uh, film by uh, Tim Burton, and this is Batman. And this is that moment uh, when uh, uh, the Joker uh, walks up to uh, uh, Bob the Goon, and he says, I kind of like this one, Bob, let's leave it. And this is when they were going in to uh, uh, deface the uh, works of art at the Gotham City Museum during this famous sequence. And so um, it, it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, painting uh, that shows up in uh, this Tim Burton uh, work. And of course, I, I always think it's interesting when they actually have uh, important artworks as a starring role in a painting. And it does happen a fair amount. Uh, study for Pope Francis and uh, study for Pope. So again, he did a number of these. Um, here's a quote, the wretched intense screaming mouth, isolated from other facial features, divorced from any narrative context, suggests existential agony, the pathos of human vulnerability, loss of faith or conviction are accentuated by the precisely rendered space frames in many of the Bacon images of Pope. And I thought this kind of condenses it all uh, if you're trying to have an understanding of any of um, Bacon's work. Now this is by Yui Minjun, um, and he is an artist that is a contemporary artist that is pretty successful right now in the marketplace. And he has appropriated uh, Bacon's uh, Pope's and done it in his own signature way. Yui Minjun often does these huge grinning, uh, laughing um, self-portraits and um, his work's interesting, it really is. I often get to him at the end of the semester in some of my classes. His popes are very, very expressionistic um, and they, they um, often um, he would do something like uh, uh, reference something in the same way um, that you have Yui Minjun appropriating something from Bacon. He has actually appropriated that scream, that really primal scream. He actually appropriated it from uh, a classic moon, uh, a classic film, excuse me, called Battleship Potemkin. And there's a screaming nurse and you see um, this intense pain, broken glasses, but again, um, this was an image that for whatever reason kind of haunted him because he produced it over and over and over again in his screaming popes. So here's some more examples. Okay. Um, so this is another artist, we'll move on to uh, Beczynski, uh, Untitled 1984, he's a Polish artist. Uh, very much expressionistic, uh, said to have be expressionistic with a, a Baroque or Gothic quality. And I think you can see some of that. Haunting image of these skeletons that are, uh, certainly have a lot of musculature because they're hugging each other. And uh, it's just daunting. So um, sadly, this artist was stabbed several times and died. There was a caretaker's son um, was angry that he did not loan him a hundred dollars, so killed in his Warsaw home. Uh, so, but there is these haunted, hell-like images in uh, Beczynski's works. Otto Rapp, Deterioration of Mind Over Matter, 1970s. This is a neo-surrealist work. So Austrian, educated in Vienna, after serving in the Air Force, settled in Sweden, and then later moved to Canada, and as of uh, uh, 2011, back in Vienna. And so um, this is definitely uh, surrealist in style. We would say neo-surrealism, because again, the bulk of surrealism is in the 1930s. Hans Rudolf uh, Geiger, Swiss uh, neo-surrealist. Uh, again, this is pretty uh, dark. Uh, certainly a lot of phallic imagery in it, uh, monstrous, horrible. Uh, this is called Necronom, uh, 1970s. Perfect for my scary art uh, lecture. And this is Necronom 4, inverted uh, Geiger.
Mark Quinn. Mark Quinn um, is one of the young British artists. Um, a lot of you are familiar with Damien Hirst. You might not be familiar with Mark Quinn. So Mark Quinn does these bloodheads. Yes, they are frozen bloodheads. And these are sculptures and they're worth a huge amount on in the market, marketplace. Uh, so um, again, if you have a, an extra million hanging around and you wanna buy uh, something that, from a young British artist, this is your, this is a great choice. Um, uh, certainly it's problematic if uh, your uh, electricity goes out and your artwork starts melting. Indeed, one patron that did happen, it melted a little bit uh, during some sort of outage and um, the artist came and checked it out and said, nope, it's still good. So I guess if the artist says it's good, it's still good. Uh, so Quinn came to prominence in 1991 with this sculpture called Self um, and uh, it is uh, basically, he does this every uh, few years, and so you're actually seeing his real self-portrait, if you will. And so um, it's this, also this idea of it being kept alive by an electric supply is something that he likes too. So rather haunting to say the least. So again, here's some different images. And he does them every few years. And you can see changes in his face. You know, all of us change every four to five years. This is um, also by Mark Quinn. And here you can see the artist uh, posing with his sculpture. And this is a sculpture um, that is has tattoos all over it. Uh, and it kind of reminds you of um, years and years ago in the circuses that have the tattoo man and uh, it, it's reminiscent of that to a certain degree. Um, and, you know, um, it is, again, somebody more on the fringes of society, especially all the tattoos on the face. Uh, although, again, tattoos are becoming uh, so popular that, again, you're starting to see them a lot. So I don't know that it has as much shock value. Uh, this is um, 2011 Zombie Boy, and so again, completely covered in rather scary tattoos. So here you can see some details of the work. Really, really, the details are incredible. Ken Curry, uh, Scottish, he says this is a self-portrait. Uh, he did a few self-portraits that look a little bit scary. Uh, and uh, he was born in 1960, he's Scottish. And certainly um, these are pretty haunting. So this is a self-portrait. And you can see right behind this, another image of yet another self-portrait. Uh, so this idea of showing more the inside than the outside. And the, um, the, uh, the second image is of course very haunting. This one as well. Now, this is again, more of a child, but again, pretty haunting. Blake Newbert, um, he's still producing a lot of these works and a lot of these works essentially peel away. And so they're kind of peel away underneath and uh, they're, they're different. <laughs> uh, Edvard Munch, The Scream, well, we have to have The Scream in there. And Edvard Munch's The Scream um, is what he's perhaps most known for. And so, uh, the Scream, uh, uh, Edmard Munch, of course, was Norwegian. Uh, he struggled with depression. Uh, he didn't like to sell his works. He actually um, said that um, his paintings were like his children. And that can be problematic if you're an artist. Uh, this work has a very strong um, diagonal. He made more than one copy of this work. Uh, and uh, one of them sold for uh, around $119 million. Uh, so again, pretty incredible. Uh, so I think everyone knows this, um, this painting. Uh, here he, there, he actually I wrote a poem about how uh, he just felt this internal scream come upon him. And so this is an area that we know of in Norway. 
Uh, Norway was also known for these brilliant sunsets in this uh, particular area. So there's some thought that essentially it's, it's like that, but they're not entirely sure. There's a lot of questions about it. Also, um, uh, there was indeed a mental asylum that was uh, not too far from this area that this, um, this walkway essentially. And there's some thought that he actually heard these anguished screams, but in, a, in the document that he wrote talking about it, he felt, he said he felt this, this anguished scream within. So here's a painting called Anguished Man, Artist Unknown, uh, supposedly mixed paint uh, with blood and committed suicide shortly thereafter. Uh, this is a weird YouTube phenomena. Um, every um, couple years, you occasionally see something else pop up. Uh, and uh, he actually had an offer of $32,000 uh, for this work, and yet he chose to keep it. He said he inherited it from his grandmother. <laughs> I'd sell it, but in any case, it is pretty creepy. Paris Catacombs. Uh, so hidden beneath the vibrant European city of Paris is, are these eerie catacombs. And they house the remains of around 6 million people. Um, and so the tunnels stretch around 200 miles. Only a part of it is actually open to the public. Um, so in the 18th century, when Parisian uh, cemeteries, uh, like its largest cemetery, became overpopulated, they needed a solution. And so um, uh, they actually um, uh, transferred uh, some of uh, the bodies and buried them directly into the underground limestone um, passageways, giving the catacombs the reputation of being the world's largest grave. So, uh, ew. The entrance reads, stop, you are entering the empire of death. In French, of course. So. I haven't seen it, but I have a number of students that have, have seen it, and there's, they're like, it's creepy. I have seen the Roman catacombs, but not the Paris ones. So, uh, it's just wild. Someone got rather artistic with. Um, so, uh, in any case, so there are signs that indicate what cemetery the bone graves are from. And so, um, again, this was basically, um, taking cemeteries and relocating them. So the limestone quarries were used as a natural resource since the time of the Romans. And yes, there are Roman catacombs, again, um, just on the outskirts of Rome. Uh, and so eventually uh, the city continued to expand over these uh, quarries. Uh, so uh, in exploring uh, weird art, uh, scary art, art that is, for whatever reason, reason, intriguing, I came across Oliver Latta. Oliver Latta is an up-and-coming German artist. He's in his 30s. Uh, his work is in 3D, 2D, and live action imagery. Um, you can, uh, for instance, follow him on Instagram. Uh, he is known as Extra Wig on Instagram. Uh, and so, um, his work is is different, I will tell you. Um, he uh, chose to do his works in pink because he thought that they were too disturbing in other colors. I think so, um, but just wait, you decide. So his work's very, very distinctive. So this is contemporary. This is something you can look up right now. Um, surrealist, definitely. Um, it, it's really, really wild. But it's especially wild when you see the video. Yeah, it's very different. Willie Sue uh, creates haunting sketches of people and animals that appear as though they're trapped behind frosted glass. And this is one image. And again, a lot of you know I have a thing for hands, so here's yet another hand. A little more sinister, though. 
So um, the inspiration behind my artwork stems mostly from a fascination with the afterlife. Now, I can see that. So <laughs> after all these creepy uh, images, a friend of mine suggested that I needed to um, uh, end my lecture on something lighter. Uh, now these are uh, Tim uh, Walker's pastel cats. He's the one that did the fashion photography with the skeletons. So um, again, they're, these are a little more benign. And here, so we can end on a little happier note, puppy pictures. So uh, thank you. Happy Halloween. <laughs>